by Jay was career in both tech companies and academia led them to focus on cloud security, machine learning, behavioral analytics, and now to work on private cloud management. So this talk will take you from the basic principles of asymmetric cryptography to the ways elliptic curves are applied in Monero's cryptographic mechanisms. So Jay, the stage is yours. Thank you. Uh, so thanks everyone for coming. Uh, so in the next 20 minutes or so, we'll just um, talk about, that's fine, uh, I guess. Uh, so we'll just talk about um, <clears throat> certain concepts in the elliptic curves and how they are used in, to construct the Monero address. So uh, this talk is not intended to be uh, too deep in the math, and it's, you know, it's just intended to give you some uh, certain concepts to hopefully understand them. Whether you have a good uh, background, deep background, or whether this is the first time you're hearing about elliptic curves. So uh, elliptic curves, this is the um, uh, general uh, formula for elliptic curves. Elliptic curves is not just one curve, it's a family of curves. And as you can see, uh, those two parameters, A and B, are the certain uh, values uh, that A and B are the values that specify uh, the curve, um, you know, the curve shape, and therefore the properties of, of this curve. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> Okay, so this is a bunch of some, you know, samples of those curves. Uh, so as you can see on the, on the left side, <coughs> uh, this is A and B. So these are various values for A and B and how the, the curve will look like. So again, uh, when we say elliptic curve is not just one curve, it's a family of curves. And then uh, people will go and take certain uh, values for A and B and specify, study, prove some certain use cases for those, uh, those curves. Uh, then there's another uh, terminology here, which is um, what we call a field. And the field is essentially the combination of the values of A and B, right? Or the permitted values of A and B, right? Uh, so that is uh, another concept uh, that is uh, known in this, uh, in this regard. <laughs> So now uh, there are a couple of operations that we want to uh, talk about, um, and those are very um, <coughs> kind of uh, essential when, when talking about elliptic curves. One is known as addition operation, and the other is uh, the duplication operation or multiplication operation. Right. So a multiplication is technically a bunch of additions. So when you say five times two, it means five plus five. Right. So that's the basic concept. So when we talk about multiplication, we are technically talking addition. When we talk about duplication, we are also talking about addition because duplication of A is essentially A plus A, right? So uh, everything is you know, explained within the, the notion of addition. What we're gonna do over the next few slides is to go over the concept of addition, try to understand it, uh, understand how the elliptic curve performed the addition, okay? So uh, first, when we have one single point on the curve, and let's say the point G here, it's a random point on the curve. And we have this curve with a certain A and B parameters, right? This is an elliptic curve, one instance of elliptic curve. Now, if you want to take this G and add, add another G to it, right? So we want to compute 2G out of this G. Essentially, we want to say G plus G, or we are duplicating G into 2G, right? So uh, the steps uh, in the elliptic curve is that you take the tangent, which is uh, which is uh, the straight line that touches that point, and this tangent is guaranteed in the elliptic curves to cross the elliptic curve only in one other point, okay? So this tangent here will cross in this point, and then step two, we take the reflection of this point into the other side of the X, and then that becomes 2G. So the addition operation in the elliptic curve in general, right, is performed in this manner. You take a point, take a tangent of this point, and then you take the reflection on the x over the x, and that gives you the 2G, okay? So that is uh, the, uh, so let's take another example. So now we have two points, not one point, two points, G and, and 2G, and we wanna produce 3G out of it. So the process in elliptic curves is that you take the line between 
G and 2G, the straight line, and that's only, only one line, right? And uh, this line is guaranteed to cross the elliptic curve in only one spot, one, one point. And that's where we see here, uh, when we do the cross, the cross goes up to this point, and then we take the reflection over the X, and that becomes 3G, okay? Uh, one more example, which is how to get number 4G. Okay. So here we have um, number 1G and 3G, and we want to produce 4, which is 1 plus 3. And the process is just, you just draw the line between the 1 and 3, and then you find the cross point, which is guaranteed to be only one single point, and then you reflect that on the x-axis, and that's where you get 4G. So you see, those, those four points are essentially originating from one single, quote-unquote, seed point, what, which uh, we are calling G here, right? So as you can see, you are, as you are adding, first you pick one point on the curve, and then you are adding this point to itself, as many times as you want, and you are technically always on this curve, right? So you're technically moving as if you are mo moving randomly on this curve, right? That's, that's the idea. Um, <clears throat> okay, so now uh, the next step into this addition is that the addition is not just, you know, you just go, go and take, you say, if I want to produce 10G, I will not go and add, you know, 1G, 1G every time, uh, so that it costs me nine operations. I would do it a bit more, you know, smarter, right? Uh, uh, I would say, <clears throat> uh, I will take T G and G, and then that will just 2G, and then I'll take 2G and 2G, that will give me 4G, right? Because the duplication operation is as costly as one addition operation in this manner, right? And therefore, I can end up with 10G in, in four steps. So that's another uh, kind of uh, one of those uh, uh, features of the elliptic curves. Because always, you know, in the basic mathematics, always NG plus RG, not necessarily the same number, right? We'll just, you know, uh, in the basic math, N plus R uh, times G. Even though it's not technically you're adding G as an absolute number to another G, there's a, it's, a, it's an elliptic curve addition, right, uh, method, right? So now, elliptic curve, as we said, is a, it's quite a gigantic field, right, in the cryptography. And there are so many different techniques out in the, uh, uh, in the literature, right? And the specific one that's used in, in Monero, there's one curve that's specifically used for Monero address generation. And it is part of a family in the twisted Edward curve. So there's a family called Edward's curves. And out of that, there's a twisted Edward curves. And one of those is uh, the one that's being used by Monero. And we'll talk about this specifically. This is the specific curve. So as you can see, this goes under the umbrella of elliptic curve following the first equation that we saw. It has certain parameters for A and B, and a, a set of additional concepts or parameters or values that are set specifically for this, this curve. The field uh, defined over this, uh, uh, this specific uh, curve, which we call ED25519, uh, the field is uh, over those values, 215, uh, to, to the power 255, uh, 255 minus 19. And you can see, you know, if you forget the name, the name comes from the field definition. So 19 is a prime number, and 255519, uh, that's where this name comes, it comes from. So now let's pivot onto the asymmetric uh, cryptography because we want to build uh, some, you know, some concept toward uh, building the um, Monero address ultimately, right? So as a refresher, asymmetric uh, cryptography comes from, the word asymmetric comes from that you have two different keys, right? One on the encryption side, one on the decryption side. And uh, usually in the, in the literature of the cryptography, they use the names Bob and Alice that they are kind of communicating. And the whole concept of asymmetric cryptography is that you are establishing a shared secret over, or trying to communicate a shared secret over an unsecured medium, right? So the channel that you are 
communicating with uh, uh, using uh, this channel is unsecured, and you are kind of establishing some secured protocol to do that, right? That's the, the basic idea. And there's always a, a public key and a private key, right? So if, if Bob wants to send a message to Alice, Alice has a private key and a corresponding public key from this private key that she shared publicly, and then Bob uses her public key in order to encrypt the message, and then they will communicate this encrypted message using unsecured medium, and then that gets decrypted using a certain algorithm uh, with this private key, right? That's the basic concept of uh, asymmetric cryptography. So now, in the context of elliptic curves, uh, when we apply it to the asymmetric cryptography, um, Alice will have a seed value, we call it G, which is a shared value. Alice and Bob and everyone in the world knows this value. Alice has a private key, and only Alice has this number, right? It's just a, an integer, a number of a certain length, depending on the, on the curve or the, you know, the application uh, that we're using. And then the public key is just a multiplication of B times G, which we just discussed. How do we, uh, in the elliptic curve in a word, when you say uh, uh, B times G, it means that you are adding G to itself B times, right? So it, it is multiplication in the elliptic uh, uh, curve you know, uh, definition, which is just saying G plus G plus G B times. And the same concept on, the, uh, on Bob's uh, side, he has, uh, G is shared, is the same. Uh, uh, he has his own private key, he doesn't share that, but he shares the public key, which is technically just adding G to itself, uh, the number of the private key that uh, Bob's ha Bob has, right? And then uh, there is a final computed uh, uh, sort of key that will be used to decrypt. This is slightly different from the concept that we, we talked about before. He, they, they, they do a co use a computed value, and this computed value is uh, a combination, so it says, a times B times G. So A from Bob, he knows that. Uh, B times G is already shared by Alice because that's a public key. So now Bob is able to generate A, B, G, right? Alice on the other hand is able also to generate the exact same value because she has B and she has also A times G and that will end up with A, B, G, right? So only Alice and Bob can generate A, B, G uh, at, you know, given that they have something special, which is that private key of their own, right? So now, uh, in the, again, in the traditional techniques that do not use, uh, let's say, ellipt elliptic curves, such as, uh, you know, Duffy-Hellman, which is a known uh, algorithm, right? RSA and those, uh, th those families. Uh, I wanted to kind of bring both of them uh, side by side with the elliptic and elliptic curve kind of, you know, high level uh, concepts so that you see the differences. So uh, the shared G, which is some seed values, those are common between the two. A private value, so it's uh, some, you know, some value that's private to Bob, private to Alice, the same thing in the elliptic curve, A and B, right? Now the public key is usually generated with the notion of power, so you say some, some value to the power of this private key. And the same thing uh, for Alice public key, it becomes uh, G to the power of B, right? Uh, and it all comes down to the concept of that G to the power AB is the same value as G to the power BA, right? That's the basic concept, uh, uh, concept in math because uh, for, let's say, Bob, he has G to the power A, but now uh, he needs to multiply that with, sorry, he has G to the power B, and now he needs to have that to the power A. And because of this, they are able to compute the same value. Okay? On the, the elliptic curve uh, side, the computed is AB times G, right? Now, if you notice, this is to the power, and this is just a simple multiplication, which is essentially adding G that many times. And that is where we get a way much shorter key. In some, some, you know, in some cases, it's an order of magnitude. So you say four digit um, uh, or four, uh, let's say, uh, four, four, bin four uh, decimal digits. Let's say 2,800 something uh, on, the, uh, on this side. 
is equivalent to 200 something on this side, right? So there are some uh, certain use cases around this. So it's way much shorter uh, key with the same level of uh, complexity, the same level of security. Okay. Skip one. So downsides of the EC in general, right? Uh, so many are patented. So as we said, uh, researchers will take a certain you know, parameters uh, for the elliptic curve that obey the elliptic curve, and then they will go patented. So, so many of those have been patented over the years. Um, unlike uh, the RSA, it, it fails without sufficient randomness. So uh, for the generation of the private key, if you don't generate it using some you know, a true randomness, it, it, the, it might end up failing, right? Uh, so it, it, there's a high dependency on the randomness of the uh, key generation uh, algorithm that's being used. Um, some of these, um, you know, uh, curves that have been in the literature uh, were kind of being suspected or found out that they are uh, compromised or having some trapdoors. And there's one that was detected that has a possibility of, um, of a, uh, a trapdoor. Uh, and this was, um, you know, promoted in 2006 and then was withdrawn in 2014. So uh, this also is another uh, one of those caveats in the uh, usage of EC. And of course, the theoretical foundation is quite more complicated than uh, traditional techniques. Um, now, up until now, uh, or this talk is not about certain algorithms, right? So we did not discuss certain algorithms about how to generate the key and, and all that, right? It's, it's much more complicated and it's more, more math. That's not the purpose today. But I kind of brought up uh, certain, uh, you know, concepts to explain uh, the ideas. And there's one more idea, which is the modulus operation. I want to make sure that we convey this too, right? Because the modulus is just used everywhere. And, uh, you know, whenever there's a cryptography, they just use the modulus operation. And I wanted to make sure that this is uh, clear. Uh, for example, in this formula, when you say to the power n equals 16, this is pretty straightforward symbol, right? You say immediately n equals 4. But once you add the modulus becomes you know, you cannot even tell what n is, right? Because with this simple operation, even though the basic is the same, but, you know, now to the power n, this could be 16, because the mod is 16, right? The answer is 16. So this could become 16, and then n is 4, but then it cycles around, right? So add 16 to 17, you get 33. And then what is n when, you know, to the power n equals 33, you figure what that n is, right? And then you keep cycling it. So it's not a deterministic answer. So uh, I want to kind of make sure that this is conveyed now. Um, that's why the modulus is used, right, in, uh, in this context. Now, the specific use case for uh, Monero, we're going to take the uh, Monero address generation, um, just to kind of wrap up. Uh, so this is the specific curve, the twisted Edward, uh, Edwards curve uh, 25519, right? That specific curve that's used for uh, generation of the Monero address. Um, this is the field. So these are the total points, 255 minus 19, the total points that are possible to pick from for, you know, uh, for our private key and public key. So our, our private key. And then accordingly, the public key, because the public key is technically private key multiplied by, you know, certain, by G. And G is fixed. So I brought this number in here to make sure that you understand that G is not hidden. It's, it's known and it's public, right? And it's a certain number, and this is the number, okay? And then there's an additional number, which is L, and then uh, which is uh, a prime number, and that's the specific number right here. And this number is the, the value that we use for the modulus operation that we just mentioned, right? So throughout the, um, uh, the process, there's a modulus at multiple stages, and the L that you mod to uh, is, uh, the value that you mod to is L, and this is the value. So technically, the private keys that you are generating will end up between zero and this value minus one, right? Because it's the, it's the value that you are always mod to. Now, uh, the Monero address specifically, of course, is more complicated than uh, this talk, but uh, there are three types of addresses, standard, sub-address, and integrated. Uh, we'll, we'll take just the standard address, which is uh, known as the row address. The row address consists of four pieces of information. One is the public spend key, 
One is the public view key, and there's a network uh, byte and uh, the checksum. We'll just focus on the first two, but let's talk about all of them uh, in general, right? So um, Monero address is 69 bytes, and that is the specific, uh, uh, you know, um, pieces of it. The first byte is for reserved for what is known as network type, and those are predefined values. There's 32 bytes for what, what is known as public spend key, and there's another 32 bytes for what's known as public view key, and then there is a checksum that's essentially just four bytes generated from those 65 bytes using some hashing function. And, this is, uh, and then we take those 69 bytes, we use a certain encoding algorithm known as base 58, and then that will end up with 95 95 characters, which essentially represent the raw address. And this is an example of the address. I'm sure every one of you saw some example like this. So the network uh, type, there are two main uh, values. The first one is uh, 18, which is uh, 12, in, um, uh, you know, uh, 12 in hexadecimal, and this is 53 for the test, right? So either the main or the test, or you can generate uh, something else. But those are the two main uh, things that are known for the first byte. And then uh, that is uh, the piece that you want to connect here. So there are, um, again, we are not talking about certain algorithm, talking in general, right? So uh, ideally, we create two private keys. Let's call them A and B. One is going to be used to create this public spin key, which is technically A times G, right? Connecting to the elliptic curve. And the public view key, B times G, OK? Um, and then in the, you know, in the middle of this operation, you always have to restrict yourself to that L, which is also predefined by the mod operation. Now, in reality, we don't generate two uh, separate private keys. We just generate one in order to create the public spend key. And then using that, we hash it in order to create the other private key. And we, from that, we create the public view key. For, you know, for the address. And the address is as simple as, but you know, this is again not certain algorithm. But the address uh, ultimately is just stitching or concatenating all of these values together. And then uh, you do the Monero um, base 58. Uh, the base 58 is uh, a certain algorithm that essentially just picked 58 uh, characters. And all the letters will be encoded with 58 characters. Not, you know, usually we use 64. Uh, but uh, 58 is used here and kind of highlighted the ones that are eliminated the zero, uh, the I, the O, and the little L. And the reasoning uh, is that those characters are confusing with each other. So the I is usually confused with little L. That's why they are both removed. And the zero and the O are usually uh, confused with each other. That's why they are removed. And that's where the base 58 uh, comes, you know, and became uh, quite popular for that, for that specific reason. And the last part of it is the checksum, which is, um, it takes just 65, uh, uh, the 65 bytes and then generate, uh, the, uh, you know, with certain hash, the first four bytes for the checksum. Uh, and so uh, that's, about, uh, that's about it. Some, some readings for, uh, you know, uh, where this talk came from in terms of the um, resources. And hopefully this was quite helpful in terms of understanding how the Monero address is created. Thanks, everyone, if you have any questions.